What? Hello everyone. Hello everyone. <laughs> so we want to read something out to you guys. So Sabahat and I met today. Okay. <laughs> we met today because we were feeling really alienated, which is the general condition that patriarchy puts you in. Um, so we decided to read each other feminist texts that have really inspired us and we thought we should read them to you. Yeah. I think it's incredibly important to read and survive. Survival! Reading is survival! Reading is survival, yeah. absolutely. Wait, what was that? Oh, it's just <laughs> Okay. So, our discussion really began in the ways that our bodies feel trapped in these structures of, of patriarchy, of power, and how it's so difficult to resist them. It's so difficult to escape these structures. Your body is forever entangled in the nexus of, of power relationships. And we're trying to work out all the ways in which we can resist this nexus. It's incredibly... It's like a... What is it? That's just space. Mein hota hai, gol, gol. Black hole. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a black hole, it sucks you in, yeah. you know, it, that interpolation. It doesn't let you speak or yeah. be heard. So, uh, yeah. So we started reading these things. I read something to Sabahat and then something came into her mind and then she read me this. And then I read her something. Um, do you want to talk about what you're reading? Yeah, so, so I was reading to him this article that one of our professors, Adeem Suhair, he taught us in IBA when I was taking a course with him. And it just talks about how, um, you know, things are recorded on paper, like through bureaucracy and how it actually takes place. And this is, this article is about a widow who gets impregnated out of wedlock and then to save her from social suicide in the sense that if someone gets to know, they will literally like kick her out of the social um, circle, right? So the women around her kind of gather and decide that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, um, Get, get her an abortion, right? And when, when they give her the medicine for abortion, unfortunately, Chandra, who, who, who's the woman who got impregnated, uh, she passes away. Dies. She dies. Uh, uh, and this is about that, right? So I was reading this. Uh, so this, this article is about, uh, from, it's written by Ranajit Guha. And what I was reading was actually by, I can't pronounce his name. Simon D something. Simon de Boa. Boa. Okay. The French feminine. Yeah. So I was reading this. White woman. I'll read this. Yeah. You already heard. Okay. When man, the better to succeed in fulfilling his destiny as man, asks a woman to sacrifice her reproductive possibilities, he is exposing the hypocrisy of the masculine moral quote. Men universally forbid abortion but individually they accept it as a con convenient solution of a problem. They are able to contradict themselves with careless cynicism. But woman feels these contradictions in her wounded flesh. She is as a rule too timid for open revolt against masculine bad faith. She regards herself as the victim of an injustice that makes her a criminal against her will and at the same time she feels soiled and humiliated. She embodies in concrete and immediate form in herself man's fault. He commits the fault but gets rid of it by putting it off on her. It is as her first abortion that woman begins to know. For many women, the world will never be the same. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's basically Chandra who is a widow who gets impregnated, right? And the, and, the, and the man who I can't find the name of, Abhi. I think it's Magar, yeah. So the man actually comes to Chandra's mother and says that, you know, let's get her an abortion done. But that's to just save his face. And it's not to save Chandra from like the social um, outcast that she might become because of, because if someone finds out. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think what you're talking about is very interesting is this double bind you know 
where on the one hand to save her self from the social suicide because if you're discovered uh, uh, to to you know uh, uh, to be pregnant uh, that virtually means uh, social suicide and yeah. this is a Bengali uh, Working, Setting, yeah. you know, working class uh, woman, so it's all the more difficult for her. Um, and so, even when she tries to save herself from that social suicide by taking these medicines that will then eliminate the pregnancy, she dies. She dies. So it's this. You know, and also it's interesting how um, throughout this article. I mean, the, the mother of Chandra and her sister who actually gives her the medicine, they are kind of aware, you know. Uh, I mean, she says in like the testimony she gives to the police that I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it's going to kill her or not, right? Mm -hmm. But they would rather actually uh, let their daughter and sister die than mm -hmm. have her like mm -hmm. exhumed from their society. Yeah. It says a lot. And also, when it talks about the uh, masculine moral code, um, you know, it's interesting. How uh, even like in our daily lives, we see how the patriarchal figures of the house can, you know, very conveniently change the rules when it's saving their face, yeah. right? And for us, it's never the same. Yeah. Which is why, like, um, like a couple of days ago, I was writing something on like family values that we are born with, right? But it's interesting how we're never like this never happens. Like your mom and dad don't ever sit you down and give you a list of values, right? It just comes. Up when you somehow contradict that value. Yeah. Ke humare, um, you know, values ke hai ye baat, you know? Yeah. But you never give a list of them. Yeah. And I feel like I feel like that's a very uh, powerful tool um, for the patriarch of the house because since there are no written rules, he can like bend them, yeah. bend them, whatever and, and however they. Um, th this idea of of not knowing what to do because whatever you'll do. It'll be framed as, uh, you know, it's this inescapability from violence, yeah. you know, uh, this sense of being trapped. It, it sort of reminds me of this uh, um, Misra by Sara uh, Shagupta, where she says, And I think that's a, such a beautiful, visceral yeah. metaphor. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating, right? It's, frustrating. It's, it's, it's not knowing what to do, because whatever you do will be somehow co-opted, manipulated against, against you, you right? Absolutely. And this idea of the idea of not being able to speak uh, is again something that Gayatri uh, Spivak talks about, whom I love and then I'm judged for being a pseudo Khadar Posh. <laughs> you remember that? I, Forget I, it. I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, because when Sabahat was reading this to me, um, I this idea of dub, the double bind of, of not being able to escape, I thought of this passage from Can the Subaltern Speak? We're not subalterns, obviously, because the fact that we're here and we're talking, we're, we have an access to language, whereas the subaltern is even removed from lines of language, from cut, of, cut from all the lines of mobility, linguistic or otherwise. Um, but I think something that she talks about here uh, definitely says something uh, and speaks to the way that embodied subjects feel in patriarchy in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a small passage that I read. read um, you guys, you do. <laughs> this is from Candace Subaltern. It's actually from an interview that alludes to um, for uh, to the piece can it subordinate speak and the piece is about this 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 girl uh, Bhuna Veshwari who's uh, who is the subaltern in question that Spirak is writing about and she has a very complicated story because she's an anti-imperialist and she's Spivak's grandmother's sister uh, and she is uh, she's supposed to kill someone, a, a white person, as part of the anti-imperialist struggle. And back in those days, the idea was that if you could not kill them, then that would bring a lot of shame to the to the struggle. So then you'd have to kill yourself. Um, but here, she cannot kill herself 
बिकॉज शी इज अ वुमेन सो इट्स ऑल द मोर कॉम्प्लिकेटेड फॉर हर बिकॉज देन पीपल विल से अच्छा शी स्केल्ड हर सेल्फ बिकॉज मे बी शी वॉज प्रेगनेंट एंड शी इज हैविंग इलिसिट प्रेगनेंसी सो शी वेट्स फॉर फोर डेज एंड शी इज देन ऑन हर पीरियड um so that she can she can then tell the world that i was not on an you know illicit pregnancy pregnancy, uh, pregnancy uh, and so that so that argument then can't be made for her so she literally it's like a declaration with the body right yeah. um in death but but in but it's very interesting that she waits for her for her period to make this declaration to make this feminist declaration but then she also dies um and so it's that double bind again which spivak talks about so i'll just uh, read that she was 17 years old in 1926 and she was given an assassination detail she could not kill and therefore she had to kill herself but she waited 4 days before she hanged herself in order to menstruate so that she could speak with her body and oppose the traditional gendering that says a woman exists uniquely for a man she wanted to take a position of strength against this reading of her body uh so even at that terrible time when she knew that she was going to die she waited until she menstruated because she doesn't want anybody to think after her death that she killed herself because of an illicit pregnancy and not only does she do that she even writes a letter for her sister my grandmother this is spivak's grandmother to be opened 60 years later because she didn't know when india would become independent she takes all the trouble to speak with her body speak with her body and yet two generations later my generation my first cousin who has the exact same educational background as i i came first class first in english honors at the university of calcutta she came first class first in philosophy with honors at the university of calcutta says not the person with philosophy who says why are you working on this person gayatri who has just killed herself because of an illicit pregnancy so i said in rage the subaltern cannot speak even when she speaks with her whole body even when she speaks in death her speech act cannot be completed therefore she cannot speak because it can only be completed the speech act if there is an if there is an infrastructure that can listen if there is no infrastructure of listening in place the subaltern cannot speak even though her body has spoken in every way possible in death and i think it's a it's a very yeah, <laughs> it's a very enduring passage yeah we have a minute <laughs> but the idea that even in death when we make a declaration even in death yeah so so it will it will go under yeah, yeah. like you were explaining to me a while ago you know it's not like it's not that spivak is not saying that we can't like sub, the subaltern can't talk all she's saying that even if she talks out of the, her like entire body with her entire body there's a lack of infrastructure of listening right so if, if someone doesn't listen to you then it doesn't matter even if you spoke i you think know? this goes back it's literally like you know if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear yeah. it then it didn't fall so i think what we really got from our conversation today is that part of the feminist struggle again this also goes out to allies is to develop an infrastructure of listening, listening. you need to be able to listen to the other person when they're speaking with their body or in in language and it it again goes to the idea of you know pani mein keel thokta if there is no infrastructure of listening your words your speaking your whatever you do is like pani mein keel thokta yeah, it doesn't amount it's to like, it's like it's like you know you've given her water rather than word to actually matlab thok the keel and yeah Okay, you know, there's no infrastructure. The infrastructure is basically like a word, a blank yeah. of word that you haven't given her, so she's doing it in water, and no one says anything. In the hope that we can develop a feminist infrastructure of listening, um, we can hope that. We can just hope. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye.